we are extremely excited to have Jesse Draper with us, who is a rock star entrepreneur and a celebrity, as what I see, an Emmy Award winning. Nominated, like, wow. nominated. Well, that's still <laughs> pretty big too, but um, we're going to talk about how to raise venture capital. And uh, we're really excited about being able to share the wisdom from Jesse, and then we're going to have some Q&A. Um, I'd like to just mention, as you guys know, Pink Talented Angels is a community for female entrepreneurs, CEOs, and investors. And we all know that when women support women, we become better. Our goal is to build PTA out, uh, even through COVID, through all of our virtual series. We limited the amount we're doing because I think we're kind of all zoomed out a bit. Um, but we will have another one next month, so we'll be letting you know about that. We have good news that we have a new board member and Danielle Gordman. We absolutely are thrilled to have her on the board. Welcome, welcome, Danielle. Thank you, excited to be a part of this. Yeah, it's really fun having you part of this for sure. So what I'd like to do is do an introduc introduction of Jesse, And um, you know, Jesse is a mother of two. She's the founding partner of Halogen Ventures. And Jesse and I had a conversation, we were just talking offline. When I sold my business, I sat down with Jesse um, and spoke to her and I look forward to reconnecting with her even more. But over the last four years, you've really expanded your business and it's really incredible. She's the host of an Emmy nominated television series called The Valley Girl Show. Former host. The fourth Former Sorry. <laughs> I'm like fourth generation venture capitalist focused on early stage investing in female found founded consumer technology companies. Among her 55 portfolio companies are the Skim, Carbon 38, Hop Skip and Drive, the Flex Company, LOQ, which is recently sold to Walmart. That's impressive. And this is L, which recently sold to P&G. Congratulations. That's Thank incredible, you. really incredible. Jesse stars on the set of the television series Meet the Drapers, currently in its second season. And that's on, that you can get- S-E-T, it's S-E-T Network. The S-E-T Network. S-E-T Network. Sony Entertainment yeah. Television. yeah, so everybody should check that out. There's a lot of great, I'm sure that's really great. Uh, she was listed as Marie Claire's Magazine as one of the most connected women in America. And we are absolutely thrilled to have her here. Welcome, Jesse. It's really great to have you. Thank you, Lizanne. I'm honored to be here um, with such an incredible female founder. You are, uh, are what we try to live and breathe at Halogen. So um, you exemplify everything we're looking for in our founders. And I'm very upset that you didn't take any funding for your business years ago. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so um, I see some familiar faces and, um, and I can just kind of launch into a little about me and then just dig in with Please. questions, Lizanne. Um, I, um, and I don't know if, do you guys want to, um, Danielle, I don't know if you want to remove the thing so people can the re remove the back. They're perfect. So I can like see everybody's beautiful yeah. faces. Sorry. So. Okay, um, I just love seeing everyone's faces. I'm like, who's here? Um, but um, I'm Jesse Draper. I run Halogen Ventures. We invest in early stage female founded consumer technologies. And um, there has to be a female in the founding team of five. Uh, we get in incredibly early. So that's pre-seed, seed, um, and uh, sometimes kind of in the large first friends and family angel round, we like to be one of the first institutional investors. Um, uh, you know, just to give you a little of how I got started um, in, I grew up in a, a family of entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. I was the, I'm a fourth generation female and the first, uh, for fourth generation investor and the first female. I did not think I could go into venture capital, even though it's truly 
all I knew. And I didn't think I could do that because I'm female. And um, I had this line of men before me who, um, who taught me quite a bit about business, but I had at the time growing up, you know, they say you can be what you can see. And I could see that my aunt was a very successful actress uh, in the eighties. Her name was Polly Draper. And um, I was like, oh, okay, well that's what women do. And so I would have these internships and work at startups and really it was just this um, world that I knew, but I was like, well, women don't go into that though. I've never really seen a woman in a room. Uh, in terms of the technology companies I've gone to, I'm always by myself and I don't want that to be the case. And so um, I uh, went to college focused on, um, I went to UCLA School of Theater, Film and Television, uh, went into entertainment, did some business programs on the side because I did have my dad kind of in my ear being like, how are you gonna make this a business though? Um, and then in 2008, um, I, I just realized that entertainment and uh wasn't quite for me and i had some success there i worked incredibly hard i did a show i was like in a bunch of movies and um i would go to these cattle calls and i was like you know everyone looks just like me and is way more talented and um i feel like i can be more productive with this five hours of my time where i walk into a room and they don't even ask my name and um and so it was sort of those early days of google twitter um in 2008 and i I was filming this show and we'd film for six months on and then six months off. And so I started this, um, I, I decided to start, instead of auditioning, I started this technology talk show. It was the first tech talk show called the Valley Girl Show. Um, I was trying to make entrepreneurs approachable because I had grown up around these incredible um, entrepreneurs that I would, I'd see and I always sort of was um, raised to celebrate just innovation. And I didn't understand why other people didn't look at these guys as celebrities and heroes. Um, and, uh, so in those early days, I know it was the first tech talk show. Cause I had, I got incredible people on my show cause it was early days of Google and Facebook. And it was easy to get these guys cause they were just starting their company. So I had like the former CEO of Google, Eric Schmidt on my show and nobody cared, which is why I know it was the first tech talk show. Um, we, it was my own entrepreneurial journey. And um, I, at the time, no one quite understood digital distribution. Um, I did sort of 30 different distribution deals, all non-traditional at the time. I was one of the first people to partner with like Forbes Video and Mashable, ultimately took it to television. And as Lizanne kindly mentioned, we were nominated for an Emmy. Um, and, uh, you know, through that show, after two seasons of the five that we did on the show, I quickly realized I was just interviewing men. Like all I was doing was interviewing men in technology. And so I put out this word um, and I was like, okay, where are the women in tech? And I started this series called the Rock and Women series. And um, I am forever grateful to the women in fashion technology because Jen Hyman from Rent the Runway came on my show, the Guilt Group Girls, Rebecca Minkoff, and that made it okay for Sheryl Sandberg to come on the show. And these incredible women and those things changed my life a little bit. It was like all of a sudden Jessica Alba, Mark Cuban, and um, the first CTO of the United States of America, Anish Chopra. Um, and through that, I, I made an initiative to interview 50% women in tech. And I created this, I should call it the bat woman signal. <laughs> and we were seeing hundreds of deals. Um, and I started seeing deals very early and I knew what a good deal looked like. And I was sending them to all of these venture capitalists I knew. And then I was like, wait, I have like, I don't have capital, but I have like a little bit of money. Maybe I can be a strategic advisor or write a thousand dollar check or a $5,000 check or whatever I could afford. Cause I didn't have a ton of capital at the time. And so I'd write these tiny checks to some of these companies and say, you know, you're too early for the show but I love what you're doing. Can I write you like a pennies check um, or negotiate some sweat equity? Some of those deals ended up doing really well for me. Um, one, I sold for a 25X return on the secondary market. I like to share numbers because I think that's something that women don't do enough because we've been taught not to and men have been taught not to share numbers with us. Um, and so I used that little track record then to raise my first fund. I pitched probably 500 potential investors and closed maybe 50 of them. Um, and we're now on our second fund uh, in the middle of, of raising, doing well. We have over 62 companies, all female founded. We've had six exits in the last two years um, and uh, we're just getting going, but uh, we've grown our team and it's a really exciting time. 
I also look at investing in women as an opportunity. I think often we're placed as this charity case. And I just want to, since we have incredible women in this room, women are not charity. This is an opportunity. This is a money maker. And that is how we have to like change, you know, how the pocketbooks look right now, because right now men control the majority of the capital and we need men. We need that capital, but we also need to like level the playing field. And in order to do that, um, I need every single one of you to build a billion dollar business and then invest it back into the ecosystem uh, with a, a more diverse um, uh, employee base. And that's diversity of age, race, and gender. Um, but um, that's, that's a little about me and how I got started. And then I know I see some familiar faces. I see Ashley Crowder, who if you guys don't know, runs Montana and she, um, it's an incredible hologram company. I see Joy Chudikoff, if any of your companies need, um, a, need some exposure, there's, she runs a great podcast, a very it's female great podcast, I just, Yeah, Yeah, it's great. Um, so, so what do you guys want to know? Yeah, so can we can we talk a little bit and just start by opening up on you know we're in COVID, and you know we know that <clears throat> that you know people are struggling, but there's opportunity right now, and people are looking at investing in companies right now, and they're actually saying it's safer to invest in the actual entrepreneurial world more so than the stock market. So how do you how do you see that? What's the best state steps for our women to take? And just kind of an overview of that. Yeah, I think you nailed it. Um, you know, we're actually seeing some of our investors pull um, money out of the public markets and say, "Hey, can we invest more in the fund um, because we think that we're going to have better returns in the private market?" And um, so I do think it's a good time to be out there fundraising. Um, I think it's a, a unique time. And I think when you are looking at fundraising for your own company, the best thing to start with is put your, um, you know, put, like try to empathize and put your feet in the shoes of the investor. So as an investor right now through COVID, um, the first couple of weeks, we really studied the 2008 recession just as much as we possibly could. And it's no secret that Sequoia, one of the larger VC funds in Silicon Valley, had doubled down on their best performing companies and they uh, had had great success um, with this uh, 2008 recession strategy that they had crafted. And so we kind of looked at that and said, okay, we're gonna pause all new investments for a moment, um, make sure our portfolio is okay. And so um, uh, we got on the phone with all 62 of our companies and um, in about a week and <laughs> divided by our three person team. And we uh, all of a sudden were investing instead of we, instead of us looking at our kind of like hundred item diligence checklist, I just threw it out the door, crumpled it up, threw it in the trash and was like, okay, we're investing based upon three things. One, can this founder execute? based upon our personal experience with them. Um, can they take this company all the way, no matter what? Uh, two, do they have runway through for the next 18 to 24 months? Like, do they have enough cash to get them through if need be? Uh, and if so, are if they don't, are they making the cuts that they need to make in order to, to have that runway? And then the third was, are they COVID sustainable and beyond? Um, and so we kind of doubled down on our best performing companies. And uh, the coolest thing about talking to everyone and getting a nice little landscape, I think it's great to be in early stage because you see these trends and what's happening in the markets much before the public markets, before these larger companies. And so we were getting calls from our companies week one and two saying, hey, we just took a 60% hit to revenue hey, we just took a 90% hit to revenue. Um, something weird is happening. And I was sitting there being like, oh my God, I feel like I'm a psychic and I can see the future and it's going to be so bad and no one has any idea. And then we got on the phone with everybody and I just said, you know what? All of you and all of our portfolio companies and entrepreneurs in general are who are going to build us back up out of this. You are going to solve all the issues we're seeing right now. And being an early stage is the best place to be right now because you're actively able to be malleable and roll with the punches of COVID 
and um, BLM and all of these crazy things and the big earthquake that happened in LA last night. <laughs> um, and you're able to adjust and create the best companies to make solutions for over the next 10 years. So the way I look at investing as an investor is, are you going to be a billion dollar business in the next 10 years? Five would be great, but typically we kind of think in 10 year increments of time. So if you go back and you think about 2008, all of the biggest tech companies you know, Uber, Slack, um, all of these companies came out of a need in the 2008 recession. So if you think about kind of what we need now um, and how you adjust to those times, that's a great way to approach an investor and just have in the back of your mind. Um, in terms of raising funding, um, I think it is, it's a tough time to raise because you're just not as connected. So make sure you're staying connected. I think we always believe in um, getting our companies into accelerators and we're always checking in on accelerator demo days and working with people like um, uh, Pink Talented Angels to source deals. So doing things like this is a great way to get out there and meet investors. Also scraping LinkedIn, um, going on um, Crunchbase and seeing who the companies you admire or competitors have had invest in the early stages. Um, is a nice way to kind of like make a list of who you should target or uh, similar companies you could target in terms of investment. Uh, and just reaching out, you know, we, we believe in access, not all VC funds are like this, but you know, for Halogen, you can, we take cold pitches through our website, halogenvc.com. I've taken pitches on uh, Twitter, Instagram, you know, we, I think being an investor, you're putting yourself in the position that you have to be accessible. Um, that's, what we do for a living is take deals and look at deals all day long. Um, so I think it's just about putting yourself out there. Right. What and does then, it look um, like? Hey, Jesse, what does it look like? Like what's the best pitch that you have today that you've gotten on your website? Cause with COVID you can't meet in, in person, right? Mm -hmm. So how do we help our women prepare the right pitch to get the attention to at least get the door open? Yeah, um, such a good question. And I think for us, we're spending, and I was just on a panel earlier today with um, someone from NEA as well. Um, and we were talking a lot about just how we're spending much more time in diligence. We're spending many, many more hours in diligence because some of these founders that we're now investing in, I mentioned that we you know, paused all new investments. We now are making new investments. Um, but we paused all new investments for a moment and then started making new investments after doing significant diligence. Some of these people we haven't met in person. And so what we do is, you know, call references, um, do a, much deeper dives on um, the industry as a whole. So anything like that, that you can prepare in your data room is very helpful. The way I would look at the pitch is, you have your 10 page deck, you might send to them beforehand or walk them through on a Zoom call. Always show your face. If you're not showing your face um, in one of these pitches, explain why, because that's a moment to connect with um, a human. And I think that's incredibly important right now. Um, you know, maybe you walk them through this 10 page deck. Some of the things I would include in the deck are, you know, what problem are you solving? If it's a busy space, I always make sure, I want to, I, I usually ask, you know, what are the three things that differentiate you in this space? Why are you the best in this space? So make sure you have those, um, you know, show the opportunity, uh, make sure you know the market size. Um, and then women in particular have trouble asking for capital. And so whether or not you ask, make sure the last page in your deck has the ask. So you don't even have to say it. It's just there. It's in the deck. It's like I'm raising $2 million at a $5 million, you know, pre-evaluation. And, um, you know, we have this much soft circled or these people are involved. Um, and then uh, make sure you have a team slide. So I'd say you walk them through that first deck, talk them through your business, get to know them a little bit. And really, I think at this point, it's about getting to know them. So if you can think of other opportunities to get to know these investors, whether it's like, you know, share a little something personal about yourself. The cool thing is we're in our homes now. So kids are running in and out. So there are opportunities to really connect in different ways. And so I think those are some silver linings. I don't know about you guys, um, but I used to like lock my kids in a closet when I was having a Zoom call before. And um, 
now it's okay if they run into the call. And uh, I think that's a really cool thing. Uh, and then, uh, and then, you know, I think address like today in your pitches, you should address COVID. I think it's weird if you don't and you say, you know, here's kind of what, how it's affected us, um, good or bad. And here's how we're planning for the future. Um, and then, uh, you know, make sure you break down what you need in terms of that raise. So if it's $2 million, you're hiring a lead salesperson, a new CTO, some marketing spend. Those are kind of like some of the typical things we would see in use of proceeds. Um, and then, uh, so you have that first call and then, um, you say, okay, I'm always like, what are the chips you give the investor to keep them coming back? Like when I put my founder hat on, it's like, okay, so you, you don't give, if you can, like, don't give them the deck until the pitch. And then you get the meeting and you get the pitch and you get the FaceTime. And then it's like, okay, at the end of your pitch, you will save so much time if you ask the investor straight up and say, is this interesting to you? Is this something that you and your fund would be interested in investing in? What is your process? And then you, you know, if they say yes, because you'll know instantly if you should keep spending time with this person. And if they say yes, then it's like, what's the next chip to keep them engaged? And so um, today, that would be the data room. And if you can save them hours of diligence and put all of this information I was mentioning before in the data room, the research on the industry, you know, any kind of projected financials you feel like sharing or financials um, in general, um, you know, re a list of references, um, just save them time. I think that will set you up for success. Um, and then you can follow up in a week and say, hey, did you take a look at our, um, you know, at our data room, what did that look, you know, was there anything missing that you'd like us to see? Do you have any other questions? I'd love to hop on a call next week and hear what you're thinking. Um, and it's really about getting to know them. And then also when you are fundraising, <clears throat> even for me, it's like, sometimes I, you, you get discouraged because people say no, but that's okay. Like, don't look at that as a bad thing. Just be like, okay, I got to know. Thank God I got an answer. I don't, I, I'm not going to like spend more time with this person, but also I want to know why. So ask why, say, hey, do you have any advice? Do you have any feedback? And it's usually something that you can't control. Uh, it usually is like, oh, well, we're not very liquid right now. We're not making new investments. This isn't one of our industries of focus. Um, that has nothing to do with you. None of those things have anything to do with you. So you can like put them in another category and maybe follow up with them next round. Um, I think it's always good to kind of like keep these keep people posted because sometimes they'll want to come in later. And if they do say no, it's about keeping them along for the ride. Um, the best founders I know send out quarterly updates to an investor list um, and say, here are the five milestones we hit this quarter. And then I see that over time, they did what they said they were going to do when they pitched me initially. Yeah. And I get to know them that way. Um, so those are a couple of the things that's I would think about. Really, that's really smart. Melissa or hi, Melissa. Um, she had a question, dig more into the key criteria, criteria that you look at when you want to invest. So you talked about what the, what the founder needs to kind of put up. What do you pull from that that gives nuggets of you to say, boom, I want that one, I'm investing? So as a fund, some of the things we focus on are one, the founder is first and foremost, um, the most important thing. The founder, the founding team, if it's a founding team, do they have complementary skill sets? We do like co-founders. If you don't have a co-founder, that's okay. Just, I wanna make sure you have someone that you can lean on or a team that you can lean on. And so there's people who can help um, because again, if you put your investor hat on, it's like, I'm writing a check to you. So I wanna know that if something happens to you or you have to take a leave, there's a team that can execute. Um, so first and foremost, founding team. Uh, secondly, we look for a really unique product offering. Uh, we like to be a first or second mover in the space. Um, Lizanne mentioned that we had, uh, we sold Eloquy to Walmart and um, 
that was the first plus size women's clothing marketplace I'd ever seen. And that was five or six years ago. Um, and they sold last year. Um, now there's quite a few of those. And if you're running one, don't get discouraged. But I like to see the first or second mover in a space. So if you are running one now, you'd have to come and just say, this is why we're different. This is why we're different than all the eloquies of the world and why we found a bigger opportunity in this market. Um, and so we like to get into the first or second mover in a space typically. And then right now, um, oh, and then the third thing we kind of look for is um, really overall traction. That could be a million in revenue. It could be a hundred thousand users, email addresses, customers that could, but don't let those numbers scare you because we also do invest pre-product because not everybody has a million bucks in their back pocket to invest in you know, in, in some kind of um, like in, in themselves, in a company, especially if it's pre-product in a hardware device, for example, that you need to get off the ground and you have to spend a million dollars just to get to like the prototyping phase. So if that's the case, figure out how to prove to me that there is a huge need for this, whether it's research or you talk to a whole bunch of customers in some way, um, just prove to me there's a need for this. Um, and then, so those are a couple of the sort of high level things that we look for. And then in terms of diligence, we do like to look at financials. I'm married to a CPA who um, I'll just never forget, you know, um, years ago when we met, I had like run some financials of one of these companies we were going to invest in by him. And I was like, what do you, what do you think of these financials? I just wanted another opinion. And he's like, very optimistic, like every other startup. And so projections are just that, they're projections. It's like, do you think you can hit 5 million in the next year? Do you think you can hit 10 million in the next two years? Um, it never goes that way, but just some sort of, what's the plan? How are you gonna make money? Um, and then if you have, you know, financials that, you know, have actually taken place, uh, like revenue you have actually uh, made, that's always a good thing to show as well. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then I, I do talk to references. I sometimes like to back channel. I think it's good to provide a list because um, as investors, you uh, venture capitalists are, I think some of the most incredibly connected people just because we're always looking at deals. We're always talking to other investors and we're always just trying to like get out there and um, uh, get to know other industries. And so it's a lot of networking that takes place. We can usually kind of back channel in some way uh, or ask one of your references for another reference. Um, so we do try to find people also off of the list, but at least the list gives us a place to start. Yeah. Um, so those are a couple of the things that I- That's for. great, that's great. I like the idea of doing your homework on each one too, because when you're talking to them, it shows that you've done your work, right? Oh, yeah. You know who they are, their personality where they're that's at. That's such a good point. Yeah, do your research on every investor. Every once in a while, we have an investor come in the room or the Zoom room, I should say now, um, right. that I'm like, so you're a blockchain company and you have no women working here at all. Right. right. So one, I don't even know how you got in here. Uh, not that you're a bad person, but like, did you do any research on us at all? Right. Um, because you know exactly what, and it, it also saves you time. You know who you're meeting with, what they like, what comps they have in their portfolio that might um, be kind of in a similar industry. Um, and those, yeah, do your homework for sure. And I, I really appreciate it when people do their homework. Someone yeah. came recently, someone came recently and did a pitch, and just like you could tell, they had done so much research on our fund, and they were like. So what, you know, what made you make the investment into this particular company? Because I do feel like they have a similar philosophy. It's a very different business, but they had done so much research on our portfolio that I just was like, that's how they're going to execute a company. They're, they're so thoughtful. Right. But you know, back when I started Thanks Then, I never even thought about raising money. And now that, you know, 25 years later, and, you know, now investing in female entrepreneurs and really focusing on that. What I've noticed is that A, it's harder for women to get money. We, right, and you're helping that along, definitely. Um, but where is the balance of thinking about when to raise the money? Because sometimes I think a lot of the entrepreneur and the businesses that we're advising tend to think they need the money now mm -hmm. instead of having a runway to be able to prove that their business is viable, right? How do you see that? 
Yeah, I mean, okay, first of all, the best thing you could possibly do is do exactly what Lizanne did, which is she bootstrapped the whole thing and she sold it for, I believe, $250 million, which you should brag about. I'm sure you're going to feel uncomfortable with me saying that, but everyone should know she sold her company for $250 million. That means that's like basically her $250 million. Like there were some others, it had to go somewhere, a little bit somewhere else, but she, like, what a badass she is. Like, that's what you want to do. You want to make that money yourself. Thank you. you should you should look at equity as like you know someone cutting off a piece of your toe yeah it's um, gold it's gold. It's, it is it's gold and you should only really take it if you have to and also if you know or have a plan in how you're going to make it back to them the times to raise money um are more like you know say you're building a technology company and it, it's it's taking off and you're realizing you're doing every single sale for this technology company and you're actually missing out on business. You're, you know, you could actually double your revenue if you had someone else helping you sell. That's a great time to go to an investor and say, look, I'm, I'm literally breaking at the seams and I'm turning down revenue. Um, so we've decided to raise to grow. Um, and there's always, it's interesting when I talk to male founders versus female founders, women and women in our portfolio in particular are focused on profitability. Keep focusing on profitability. I don't understand these companies like the WeWorks and the Ubers of the world that go public and they like don't have the revenue that matches yeah. and they're not profitable. And it's just like, it blows my mind. Yeah. Um, so when you raise, I think that's a strength that women have is it's like, well, I'm raising $3 million and I know I can make it back. I'm using that specifically to grow. And um, you need to just have a philosophy on profitability versus growth. When do you need the money to grow? And then when are you going to hit profitability? And um, you should just always kind of be thinking about those two things because they're these interwoven parts of building a business that, um, you're always going to be dealing with like, are we focused on growth or are we focused on profitability? And you kind of can't focus on both at the same time. Some people try to, but um, you do like, if you're growing, you're growing, growing, growing. If you're trying to hit profitability, you know, you might be slimming down. It's just a different, um, you just, these are things you should be thinking about as you build your business just in general. But um, typically the best time to raise money is when you are growing or need to grow. You're feeling like your seams are breaking and you need help in order to deliver. Um, I think that's the best time to approach a VC and it's the best time for a VC to see you approach as well. I agree. Um, you know, Jesse, I made a big mistake early on. I had to do sweat equity. I don't believe it. I don't believe you. Yeah, yeah, let me tell you, I made many, but the, 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 the issue about starting out your business and not having the money to pay people. So what I did is I gave two people 1%, not even understanding what that meant, right? Now down the line, that 1% turned into millions of dollars. But when you're, when you're negotiating saying, listen, I can't pay you right now because I'm starting out of my garage and I'm doing this whole thing, but I really, you know, I'm going to give you sweat equity at 1%. It, it just, it made a big, big eye-opening mistake for me because years later I realized that I was married, okay? I went through a divorce. I had two people with 1% and California law is 50-50. Before I sold big, you can imagine the nightmare I went through is that I had to buy the 1% because there was a battle over who had control even though it was my business and I was running it. So sweat equity, be really careful about. I totally agree with you, Jesse. You know, don't go get money unless you really need it and you understand what you're going to do with it. That's also a really big nugget of information for sure. And yeah. just, you know, today you have opportunity to be able to interview the right partner. The other thing that I learned when I brought in my partner before I sold two years uh, ahead of it to Glambia, a public company, as I brought in TSG partners, I interviewed every single partner to see if they were the right ones for me. Do they believe in what I'm doing? Do they understand what my goals are? 
Do they want to take over my company or do they want to add value to my company? There's different ways and different partnerships to think about. So all of that is really valuable to dig into and understand for mm -hmm. sure. That's and don't problem. give anybody one and 1% 1 equity if you're married. That's the other thing that was a bad mistake. Um, <laughs> Uh, although I thought I'd be married forever. I guess we all do when we enter into it. You just don't know what's going to happen in the future. I do find people give away like advisory equity in the beginning of their company, not knowing what that really means. Exactly. And then down the line, people will be like, oh, you just went public. So what, where's my piece of the pie? It's like, you helped me for two months in the beginning. So really think right. about that. And it is a great way though, you know, to your point, it is also a great way though to incentivize employees if you can't pay the cash up front. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but that kind of comes into play a little bit later in the, in the growth stage of the company. So just don't give too much and always look for um, comparisons and see what other people are giving advisors and, um, and employees as well, because it usually ends up being less than you think like we had one company who gave away three percent to this like celebrity who it was a lingerie business and this celebrity wasn't supposed to wear any other lingerie on the cover of magazines and then they ended up wearing three different types of other lingerie on the cover of magazines and it was like oh yeah they own three percent of this business and they're actually like wearing the competition on the cover of these magazines um and, and three percent is a lot <laughs> i mean three percent of the end is a lot but it made my friends back it's a lot of money. It just is. And you have to think about your business as if the equity out the door from the beginning is a lot of money, right? Because you know that you're going to build this business, hopefully, to where you want to be. But I'd like to open it up, though, to Q&A, Jesse, if you're okay with that, because we have a, a lot of women that might want to ask questions. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have one quick can I ask you. Can I ask you a question before we open it up for yeah, Q&A? Sure. So looking back, like before this divorce, now knowing what you know now, how would you have set that up if right. you were going to be this incredibly successful entrepreneur? Right. So, and, and something that we're doing with the at Pink Talented Angels is we're taking a holistic approach method to the way that we're helping advise our entrepreneurs. And the question that you just asked has a lot to do with how are you looking not just at your business, but how are you looking at your personal financial situation also? Remember, those two morph together. So how do you stay clear on the fact that I want to own my equity all the way through? I'm married. What do I do to make sure that this uh, the company is set up correctly? First of all, really good legal advice. You know, I have an attorney that's been with me for 22 years. And I rely on him. He knows everything about me. If I would have had him at this time, he would have said, what are you doing? Don't do that. So good advisors legally is really important. Um, and also, you know, there are ways that you can set up a corporation if you're married that are outside of the, 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 the I don't want to say legal rights. I don't even know what the right words are, but you are able to set it up so that you're protecting yourself um, where 100% of the equity is yours, not you're entering into this as a married person with split equity. So, you know, I, I, I made a lot of mistakes early on. It was is back in the day where, you know, it was just day after day trying to find money to, to roll through it. But if I would have had the right legal advice and if I would have understood how to do you know, set it up where these two employees didn't have sweat equity, but they had some sort of bonus program attached to what was going to happen through the equity build that would have been different. That's great. It's good advice. Yeah. 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 Legal is key. That's good advice. Legal is key. Yeah. And uh, expensive, but for our PTA members, you know, we do have a sponsor um, that is a, that is an expert. So when we choose our our four entrepreneurs for the next year, they get free legal advice to support them through this process. So there's a lot of nuggets here that we're giving to help our entrepreneurs. And, you know, maybe I should, Jesse, just you bringing that up, maybe I should have her be our next person to speak about how to do that, right? Yeah, I think that's great. And lawyers are, 
are good too. Um, most law firms now have a startup program, I think, and you should make sure you're working with one who's familiar. So they'll defer pay a lot. Um, so they will defer pay till you have a round of funding. And that's very helpful as well. So you can still get legal advice for free in the beginning. Oh yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, so do we have any questions? Are there questions in the queue, Danielle? Or um, so Amira has a question. Hey Amira. Um, so about the equity, how do we strike that balance between being cash versus equity for the earliest employees? It depends what kind of cash you have. I think, um, you know, it's good to go kind of figure out what market is and then um, what the market rate is paying and then what you can pay. <laughs> and then, um, you know, if you want to hire talent that, you know, will deliver and maybe a little more expensive, um, you know, you can kind of split the difference and say, you know what, I know that market rate is $100,000. We can only pay you seventy five. dollars um, I'd love to incentivize you to work here and, you know, give you a tiny piece of equity that makes up for that uh, over a four year vesting period um, so that they work hard, they, you know, hit their goals, they, um, their equity vests over time. And um, that's typically what, what we see. Um, so Charlotte wants to know, how do you attract high quality advisors without giving away sweat equity? I like, I'm all about testing people out at our fund, uh, at our companies. I'll introduce people and say, hey, they want to be an advisor. They think they can be helpful. Hey. Have a couple yes, meetings. Please. Oh, sorry. Did someone say something? Oh, just, oh, sorry. Um, but um, I, I like, I think they should test people out. Like they should uh, consult, a consulting gig is a great way to go where you say, hey, let's do a six month project uh, and see how this works. That's good, better actually for hiring people. But in terms of advisors, I sort of say have three meetings with them, see what they deliver in terms of being an advisor. And if they really are helpful and bring in say, you know, Google and Facebook as a customer and actually make introductions that they're promising to do. Um, I think you can decide that in three meetings um, and see if it's valuable enough for you. There's also different types of advisory equity where um, they kind of only make something if you, uh, you know, sell, have a big exit within, there's, you should definitely talk to a lawyer about this too, but there's different ways of um, giving away equity where um, it wouldn't be so much sweat off your back. Yeah, and Jen had a good point. She said um, you could call it mentoring at first, so that's less formal um, before compensating them as an advisor. I love that. Yeah, um, and then so Joy uh, wanted to give a shout out to the She's Got Moxie podcast. Um, so it's going to be dropping in August with Lozanne as her guest. Um, and she left her email here if anyone wants to get onto the podcast as well. Joy is so great and so supportive of women in business. And you guys love, yeah, she's great. Right. Yeah. Um, should go on her podcast. Um, yeah. And then Sashi um, was just giving a shout out. And she <laughs> had an awesome connection with both. Um, I Nick love you all. And Jesse. Um, <laughs> and Sashi, Sashi's one of our, yeah, tell a little bit about Sashi, Danielle. And Jen Saxton. I love you too. This is so fun. So Sashi is the founder of this incredible company called Tea Drops. And um, she's actually one of the featured founders that, for this quarter with Pink Talents and Angels. Um, and then Halogen is also an investor. So there's an awesome connection here. And sashi has been benefiting from all the different things that PTA offers. Um, she submitted an application and she was chosen to be highlighted basically for the, the next few months. She's getting legal advice. She's getting one-to-one -one mentoring with Lizanne. She's getting financial advice and it's it's hundreds of hours. So it's it's definitely a huge benefit if you apply to get this program. Yeah, also, Tanya, Tanya did a whole, Tanya and Josh did a whole deep dive on her marketing with her. And she's working with UBS on her personal finances to really set herself up for what we spoke about, right? Not having that crossover. Um, and yeah, we're I just, really proud of Sasha. I don't know if you guys she's can a, hear me. Yeah. Oh, there she is. Yeah, go, go for it. Oh, go. no, I was just, you know, I just gave a shout out because both of you guys have been instrumental in my journey and 
I think do so much for the female founder community. So I just wanted to acknowledge you both because it's like so much of this you don't have to do, um, but it's made the world a difference in guiding me. And I so appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you making us a billion dollars. Yeah, so and, and, and by the way, I'll be talking to Jesse about investing soon. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> billion, a billion, here we come. Yeah, there we go. There um, we go. It's all we, train, we make all of our founders promise that they'll sell for a billion dollars. So yeah, that's, if you take a check from us, that is, that is a, you've signed, that's what you've signed basically. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Basically. No problem. No problem. <laughs> I have 10 years, right? Yes. You have five? 10 years. Five? Okay. five would okay. be great. <laughs> okay. No big deal. <laughs> but thank you both so much. Honestly, the uh, PTA has been such a phenomenal resource for me. And I think I saw Tanya, on the call as well. And just the time you spent to deep dive into tea drops and give us some great ideas for um, some marketing campaigns and all the work I'm doing with Austin at UBS. Um, I mean, so much of what you said, Lizanne off the bat about, you know, I think as a founder, you spend so much time investing in your business and how to financially, um, you know, get your business off the ground, but you just completely neglect your personal life. And so I really appreciate that support and also insight to focus more um, there and just even have the time and space to think about how to set things up correctly from the get-go. Well, Sashi, I have to tell you, you are an entrepreneur that is able to take information in and to be eloquent way you manage your business and the information coming to you and you execute and that's what it takes, right? Is when you have advisors or people that come in to talk about or give their opinion or help show what the trends are doing and you're able to bring it in, think about it and say, yes, that works. That doesn't, that is what it takes is execute quickly and understand your brand. And, and that's what you've done. I'm um, just to, to do a shout out for Tanya. So Tanya worked for me at Think Then, and she is just about one of the the, the smartest brand strategist that I think you can work with. She helped me identify the voice. I knew in my head what I wanted, but I, it was really hard for me to kind of spit it out. And so she sits on our board, she's available. We also have Rebecca uh, Edwardson, uh, who's on the board. Um, we have Lori Rosenthal, who's also on the board. Danielle, and then Matt David, who is, uh, used to be my Trader Joe's buyer for 20 years. So we have retail expertise also within PTA. So just so you all know, the vast skill set of the women involved here can add such value to your business. And we really hope that we can continue to build this platform of women supporting women and being able to deliver the promise of helping you learn from people like Jesse, who just is wise and is really you know, there to help females. So Jesse, here's a question. Can our women, uh, how can our women get to you to, to be able to have you take a look at their businesses and, and how would you, you know, open that door for us? Yeah. So Jesse at halogenvc.com, which I'm happy to type here. And, um, and then also you can go halogenvc.com. We take the pitches from there. Um, there's a, a pitch form you can fill out and then, um, and then I'm at Jesse C. Draper on Instagram, and I'm very accessible. Um, so we try to be very accessible. I think that's important, um, especially in terms of uh, investment dollars. We've found that investing in women has really paid off for us from a culture perspective and um, a better business returns perspective. And by investing in women and going out there and finding women specifically. We have over 50% minority-led founders. Um, we have ages from 25 to 65 in terms of our founders, and we really invest across the board. We believe diversity breeds success. Um, and so we try to um, be easily approachable. I think you look at a lot of the big VC funds um, in Silicon Valley and they're not, uh, you know, they're not particularly approachable. They say you need to get in by introduction and not everybody knows an investor. So you can find us very easily and we try to get back to you. Um, and I think Jen Great, had thank you, Jesse. 
Yeah, I'll ask my question live. Um, hey guys, nice to see Hi. you. Um, Lizanne, I'm Jen Saxton. I'm the founder and CEO of Tot Squad, uh, which okay. is a marketplace for pre and postnatal services. Um, my question is, um, and for anybody who knows me on this call, there's not that many of you, uh, this is a secret, but uh, I'm expecting baby number two, uh, and I'm still in my first trimester. Wow, Thank yay. you. So I'm just curious, I know Jesse and Daniel, you guys both have experience with like founders fundraising while pregnant. And so I'm just curious, uh, we're in a pretty solid financial position and I wasn't planning to raise until next spring and now I'm due in the spring. And so I'm feeling slightly terrified about, <laughs> do I need to try and push up a raise before I really need to do it? Or like, do you guys have any thoughts on, on like how to do it? I was actually just thinking maybe COVID is a blessing in disguise because like on Zoom, where all of my investor meetings will be taking place, it won't be as obvious. <laughs> so yeah. maybe I don't have to disclose as early. I think you're uh, fine. I, th I think you're totally, but you can raise if you think you need to raise, just make sure you have people to lean on. But I know you and I know you work around the clock and I had two kids while raising my fund. I mean, you just, you just do it. So, yeah. um, you know, you do what you need to do, but if you're in a good cash position for a while, don't raise. However, that's always the best time to raise. It is. Yeah. And you know, you for me, I, I, I didn't raise when I was pregnant, but I'll tell you what, I, I brought my babies everywhere with me. I'd go into an investment meeting or a retail meeting or a buyer's meeting, and I'd just bring my babies, one on my back and one on my belly, and then eventually one on my chest and one on my back because I couldn't afford you know a nanny. And I'll have to tell you, those memories of being exactly where I was at in my power as a female really were powerful and the biggest conversation in my relationships when I go back to talk to these buyers oh remember when you were pregnant you came in so you know I, I say stand in your power be proud of where you're at you know um, and to Jesse's point just make sure that the investor knows that you have backup so that if you take a month off with your baby they understand that the lead is this person and what they're doing and you can always bring them into a meeting or COO into a meeting. Yeah. So they're like, oh, this is like, you know, there's a team here. And um, I think sometimes founders and investors, I love meeting the teams. I like to like get to know the teams a little bit. And um, then you kind of know who the players are in terms of what happens if you do have to take a few months off. Thanks, guys. We have any more questions there, Jesse? Um, I think there was one more about what industries halogen is invested in or what you're most interested in right now. Um, right now, um, we, you know, we went into COVID and we were thinking uh, like uh, the three sort of verticals we were looking at were future of work, uh, companies that solve government inefficiencies that aren't in too highly regulated industries. Um, and then beauty tech, which is very different. Uh, that said, we invest all across the board in consumer technologies. We do about 20 to 30% CPG, uh, and there has to be some kind of proprietary technology. So for Sashi, um, you know, uh, that got across because she is disrupting tea, it's bagless tea, and she's patented this whole new process of creating tea. Um, so there's a big moat that she's built around that, so it's more difficult to take that business from her. Um, and so we're always looking for something um, that's defensible in terms of our CPG investments. Uh, but uh, that said, then now we are also looking at, we just made an ed tech investment. You know, I always look at it like we're early stage investors. We're looking around and saying, okay, what are the issues that we're having right now? We're on Zoom. You know, we have this great app called Squad that um, is like a Zoom for teenagers that was taking off before COVID, but you can imagine the, the significant growth they've had recently. Um, and, um, and so, you know, we're all about problem solvers. So now we're looking a little more at ed tech and then I come from media. So I'm terrified of making media investments because I, I literally think it's, I mean, this is horrible to say, and, uh, but I literally think putting your money in content is like flushing it down the toilet because it's just like, uh, um, I've been in the business before and, um, now I think I'm wrong. Now I think there's a lot of opportunity in media technologies. You know, we're all online 24 um, seven. Uh, someone I was talking to earlier today said, sorry, my internet cuts out when everyone gets on Netflix uh, at this period in the morning. I think people are getting ready and 
uh, everyone's on Netflix. I'm like, that's hilarious that you know that. And also I would love to see the data on who's on Netflix at this time, you know? Um, and we're just watching. Uh, so we we're looking at unique media technology plays as well. Um, future of work. I'm like, I'm so mad. I just heard this statistic that, um, or this piece of information that the government gave Delta, not that Delta is a bad company, um, but the government gave Delta more money than they gave to the entire childcare industry as a whole. And that blows my mind. And, you know, for those of you moms and dads out there, um, I think, I mean, that's just, there's such opportunity to disrupt. Uh, daycare alone is an $83 billion industry that is broken and needs huge disruptors. So we're looking very seriously at childcare. Um, so those are a couple of the things we're looking at. You can go on our, our website and we actually categorize our portfolio um, in different like parenting tech. And so you can kind of see um, on our website what we're invested in. Great, super helpful. Um, and then Joanna wants to know, um, what are some of the common mistakes women make when they're talking to investors? So you had mentioned a few of them, but what else comes to mind? Um, you know, often they say, oh, there are no competitors. And we saw 5,000 deals last year. We probably saw someone who was slightly competitive to you, if not 10 of those. And I always think, you know, entrepreneurs, and I also respect, like, the moment you meet with the investor, it's your 15 minutes to an hour pitching your business for the check. And it's important that you get your whole uh, story out, your whole pitch out. Um, but investors, often it's like, um, it's like I equate it, it's a weird thing. I equate it kind of to therapy or something where I'll take 10 pitches in a row and you don't say a word as an investor. You just kind of listen. You might ask a couple of questions, but you, you know, I think it's important to ask a question of the investor and also put, it puts your, it puts you in a power position to ask a question like, Hey, what kind of investments do you do? What's your process? Do you have follow on funding? How quickly could you close if this was an interesting deal to you? You actually like take the power from the investors. So that's, a, that's something you should just think about. Um, but also to say you have no competitors, I think is, uh, is silly. And you have this opportunity where you have this investor who's seen thousands of deals, you know, a year. And I always think the one question you should ask that investor is, have you seen anything like this lately that was interesting to you? Um, and there is this sort of investor entrepreneur confidentiality where I wouldn't want to share anyone's numbers who was competitive um, uh, or any sort of like proprietary information because we're just in the business of taking so many pitches. Uh, and I think that's unfair to the entrepreneur, but you know, I would happily list off like, Hey, here's a couple companies you should, you should get to know or look at because I think they're interesting and they're in your space. Um, and there may be competitors you were unaware of. Um, and so I think that's something like people always think they're this beautiful, unique butterfly and you all are, you're a beautiful, unique butterfly, but there are competitors that you should be aware of. And um, it's really important to know your market and know what's out there. And I would just say, just to piggyback off of that, no reason to apologize. You know, um, I, 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 I'm in a one-on-one -on -one and I hear when I ask a question, there's an apology that they don't know the answer or that instead of apologizing, say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get back to you on that. Right. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to apologize. All, it's really important to be able to explain, but not apologize. I think that's important because it shows you're standing in your power also. I completely agree with that. We have like a, um, we'll do these pitch days. We'll have like, you know, 10 companies come pitch. And I remember we had this guy, we had this um, male CEO come in, pitch a beauty company, no deck, just talk to us, raising $7 million, no real plan, had already closed 6 million. It was this sort of like crazy story to me, but I was like, you're not showing me anything. I don't know what you're doing. This is pre-product. How have you raised $7 million? Almost $7 million already. Um, and then, uh, and then the valuation is like obscene. And then, you know, the next pitch comes in and it's some, uh, some young woman who's like, I'm so, I, I know, like, I don't, I don't know. I, I know our numbers aren't like that good, but we're doing 4 million in revenue. Our valuations here. We, um, yeah, we, we've gotten a, a product to market and it's like, and she's apologizing. And I'm like, let me just tell you about this dude who just came in here <laughs> because you have a deck, 
you're prepared. You're doing 4 million in revenue. Like, why are you apologizing to me? This is the best deal I've seen all day. And it's, it's really sort of fascinating to me, but yeah, don't apologize because, um, you're probably doing great. Yeah. Yeah. Don't doubt yourself. Never doubt yourself. Um, okay. So we're at 1230 and, um, I would just like to give a big shout out to Jesse. Thank you so much. We know you're so busy and you're just Thank you. This is so, so proud of everything you're doing. And I can't wait for us next. Let's set a date where you and I can get together and see what else we can do to, to help all these female entrepreneurs out there. And uh, just to, to, to all our women, we are taking submissions for the next chosen one. So please go to our website. It is lizannefalsetto.com. But Within that, you'll see Pink Talented Angels. Hit the link, fill it out. It is an incredible value add, as Sashi said. And we do work around your schedule to make sure that you can run your business. But yeah, we add value at your convenience. Um, and Jesse, would you like to have the closing words? <laughs> Um, you know, you, you alluded to some, sure. <laughs> uh, you alluded to something earlier where you were like, um, you know, and Sashi did too, just about thinking about your own personal capital. And I think that's something that women don't do enough. And what I would say is, um, in addition to, you know, taking a risk with this business that you are building, um, in terms of your own personal capital, make sure that you're aware of any financial decisions that you're making with your significant other, et cetera, um, take risk with your capital. Know that 50% of that capital is yours if you're married um, and that you actually have, can have an impact on where that goes. You, don't, you should attend every single financial advisor meeting, meeting uh, you know, that your husband has. These are all things that I've seen regularly where the women aren't involved and realize that you know, they could actually make decisions too. And we need you to invest. Um, take risk with your money, whether that means investing in, um, you know, uh, a company, a fund, uh, the public markets, um, a Bitcoin, because it's one to 17 in terms of uh, women to men um, in, on the blockchain right now. And I think we need to change those numbers. That's a big opportunity, especially right now. Um, and just take risk with your capital. Big risk equals big reward. And the only way you're going to learn is if you try it often, you know, what the things I hear regularly from women are like, well, I don't understand investing. I don't understand how to make an investment. I don't understand what that means. It's like, you're not going to learn unless you try. So you might as well try and ask a bunch of questions. And I'm going to just tell you all a secret. It's, I'm pretending it's this like magical art and I know how to pick the winners and it's really just gambling. I'm just gambling. I'm just picking deals that I like and it's all a gamble. Like you can't predict these things. You can do as much analysis and research as you possibly can, but take risk with your capital because you know, that's something I'm sure you understand. Really great, great advice. Jesse, thank you so much. Um, ladies, reach out to Jesse. Tell us the, 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 the uh, website info again. Yeah, jesse at halogenvc.com. And I put it in this chat somewhere. Okay, you put it in the chat. And ladies, let's support each other on social media. We're going to be highlighting all of our entrepreneurs uh, twice a week. And so please, um, I know Jen sends out in the newsletter that we want to feature you on our social channels. So please send that information. And I know that we're here for you. Uh, we wish you a safe and healthy week and, and uh, we'll be talking to you all soon. So take good care. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lizanne. It was so good to see you. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, everybody.